Alright, so you're going to get your work back today. We're going to pass back your work if it hasn't been passed back already. The TAs wanted to have a look at it because I made a few additional changes and marks. And last time after class we were discussing our little exercise regarding the distance between it and et as, composed, as compared to et and a. And after the class, it was Carol who was thinking, actually et and a are closer. And I said they should be closer. It's hard to do when everybody's making noise and it's, it's really hard to hear with all, all these things going on at once. So how about if we try it again? Because I agree, frankly, that et and a should be closer. If you look at um, an acoustic picture of what's happening, et and a are closer. And they sound closer and they're much harder for Taiwanese to learn to distinguish. It and a are not that big of a problem, et and a is a problem. So how about if you quietly say them, whisper them to yourselves again, and let's decide on it, eh, eh, eh. Well, I've already prejudiced you, I know, but try it anyway. Go ahead. The whispering. Okay, but make sure that you're saying, for Dao San, make sure you're saying eh, eh, not ah. Eh. Make sure you've got the right vowel. Can you feel the difference or is it hard to tell? Carol? Yeah, just, uh, uh, just like what I asked, because uh, I thought that, uh, and that uh, more similar. They should be closer. Yeah, yeah. Closer. yeah, so last time I was surprised too. I let it go, and then Carol asked, and I think we should follow up on it, because intuitively it should be et and a rather than it and a. So anybody else besides Carol? Bella? I think I still have the problem pronouncing it the right Okay, that's part of the that's part of the problem because in Taiwan English it tends to go to a, a hujiajie a. Well, that just maybe that proves our point how close they are because it's very easy, and I think it was you who were saying that even when I'm trying hard to make a, the other person still thinks I'm saying a. I'm already trying my best now. Why do they still think it's a? If you're just a tiny bit off of a, it sounds like a to us. So I think that is really pretty good proof that they are really close. In fact, they are close. For our, to our ears, they're very different. And my British English teacher yesterday pointed out to me that there's quite a big range of variation, in the States especially, between how people pronounce e eh and e. Eh. So in the North City's accent, e eh will often sound like e, eh, like milk, instead of milk. So that's going to push e eh down further. Yeah, milk, I'd like some milk. And I talk like that when I was a kid sometime, sometimes. It didn't sound weird to me either. It was just something people did. It was more colloquial. And so, a eh will be pushed down, and then a. Eh. A eh sometimes has a schwa, a longer schwa than usual. Can. Especially in New York English, New York City. Can. 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 And in the South, it might be can. Can. Sounds like two syllables. So, in fact, there's quite a bit of variation in these vowels in the States. One person will have a stable system normally. But this person to that person, you'll find that the values for this person's a eh may be close to that person's a. Eh. So it is actually tough. You have to just work with one person and find their system. But listen to mine and then see what you think. You have to have it really quiet, so when you're ready. For A, you can hear some of the F1 format. And that's one thing that was confusing me last time, because when your mouth is so wide open, you're also going to hear some of the F1 format, so the pitch is going up. That confused me last time. I thought, oh dear, I'm hearing F1, what's happening? It's because your mouth is so wide open. The whisper format gives you not only F2, but you're also getting F1. Okay? When we do it that way, it's 
Peninsula. When we do it that way, does it sound like they're about equally distant or does it sound like one pair of them is closer? Or is it hard to tell? Bella, you're, loud. you're smiling. I think it's hard to tell. It's hard for me to tell too. Just in speech and by observing Taiwan English, I would say that et and at are definitely closer. And like Carol pointed out, that's what the data tell us. But when we're hearing the whisper, it doesn't sound like they have a very clear difference between them in, in, in distance. Okay? So anyway, that was worth coming back to, even if we don't have a definitive conclusion. It's always better to be honest than pretend we heard something we didn't. And thank you very much for your suggestions about pronunciation teaching. I asked you to write little essays and things on those. And they were all very interesting. Um, the one problem is a lot of you were suggesting that we start early and students get a lot of training in words in isolation. But the problem is, where are we going to get the teachers who are able to train these people? When I was reading them, I thought, this is really wonderful, but where are we going to get the teachers? Do you see what I'm getting at? If you go back to, you think back to Guozhong, would your teachers be confident enough and able to teach a class like that? Amy says no. Vivian says no. The rest of you? Probably not. With the teachers we currently have, we're probably not able to do that. So that's the question. Taking our current situation, the whole overall situation, into account, what can we do? Can you, can you add a little addendum? You go, fool. Add a little addendum for next week. Take into account the situation we currently have in Taiwan. Most teachers, in my opinion, most sounds pretty strong, but I think it might be true, are not able to do this. How are we going to get to the point where we can actually train people? Where are we going to get the teachers, or who's going to train the teachers? What kind of a program? Where's the money going to come from? Where's the time going to come from? Something practical. What? That's really making you think. <laughs> money. Money is one thing, but money is not the biggest problem. Money is one thing, definitely, but it's not the biggest problem. Because if we don't have the people, not only the teachers have the problem, we don't have enough people to train the teachers. It's not just that we don't have enough teachers to train the students. We don't have enough trainers to train the teachers, right? Not that many, even that, not even that many native speakers are trained in this. And very few of them are, are, very few of them are in Taiwan. So something very practical, something we could actually do. Can you add a PS, an addendum for next Monday, please? Think about it. In the current situation, what can, what could we do? Better, what can we do? But could we do is okay, too. You look like you're thinking something, Sylvie. No, I'm just, I think I'm just thinking about my English teacher in junior high school. Yeah? Shouldn't say too much. Your face is a little red, okay? <laughs> but she wouldn't be able to do that, probably. No. That's the reality. I've seen the reality because I train teachers, I know. And they try hard. They work very hard. They're good people. They're smart people. There's a lot of nice things about them, but their English isn't good enough. Just dance. Their English isn't good enough. Their hearing, their, their ability to listen sensitively is not good enough. It's like they're not in that dimension. They're missing that dimension, mostly. Not completely, but they don't have enough. Right? Is that sort of what you're thinking? You can tell me when we're off camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the problem. Most of the teachers have the same issue. And this brings us to another point I was just discussing with my colleagues. Now, you guys are great, and my lab class is great. Why would she the students this year? They're fine. But I'm having trouble in freshman English. <laughs> I'm having trouble in freshman English. It's for a different Xueyuan, Wen Xueyuan. And other years it's been pretty good. But this year I get the feeling that they're just trying to Togong Jian Liao as much as possible. And they're also impatient and they like to protest and complain. It's okay if they watch this video, I'm sorry, it's the truth. They're very smart, they're very nice, they're good students, but something's happening that they're not connecting with what they should be doing to learn English better. <laughs> so that's, that's another issue. I mean, student readiness and I don't know. So anyway, oh, I know what it was. What I wanted to say was when the people around you are always trying to get out of work, do things in the very easiest way with the least effort, the least work, what happens to you when the people around you are like that? 
unfair. It gets unfair? Are you going to keep on working as hard? Probably not. We're all human. We all have you know, the same weaknesses and strengths, pretty much, in different degrees. But if everybody around us is just fooling around and not doing much, are you just going to be very quiet and do all this hard work? No. What happens is we're very, very much influenced by our peers. And if the peers set a very low level, a very low standard, we're probably going to be easier on ourselves as well. If you have a couple of people who are really outstanding and they're getting a lot of praise and admiration, we'll probably try harder to be as good as they are. So that's where competition comes in. We talked about co cooperation and competition. Cooperation is nice for making people more harmonious and getting along, but we still need competition so we can do better, right? So my feeling is that when your peers, when the level among the peers, the standard set by your peers is low, you don't have much motivation to improve. In fact, you don't think there's any way to improve. You think this is normal, this is good enough, this is the way it should be. If you had some people as sort of shining examples and who were getting really good results and the students admired them and their colleagues admired them and then the media was interviewing them, that'd be a different matter, wouldn't it? I mean, these are the people we really admire and look how well they're doing. And you don't get such good feedback because you're not doing as well. That would push you to work harder, I think. So one of our problems is that the standards are too low overall and it makes people comfortable with low standards. And they think that's all we have to do, right? When did you think? The rest of you? This is a huge problem because if we're going to address what the situation, address the situation in Taiwan. Now English is not the only thing in the world and it's not, you know, if you learn bad English it's not going to be the end of the world. But if you really want to move ahead, if you really want to compete in the world, you need good English. There's just no arguing about that. And if you've set the standard really low, you've set the bar very low, you're never going to get above that because everybody thinks, that, thinks that's good enough until, until what? Until they go abroad and they find they can't understand and they can't communicate and they get misunderstood and people are not anxious to be friends with them because it's too hard to understand them, right? So your, your suggestions were really good in an ideal world, but we don't have that. We don't have that. So I want you to do it again for Monday, please. Take into consideration what you know the situation to be from your own experience. All of you know, you came through the system. You know it better than I do. So how can we improve things in a doable way, something with current resources? Money is not the biggest concern, but human resources are more important. Where are we going to get the humans who can do this? And where are we going to get the time? Because teachers already work very, very grueling long hours, right? They often have to, um, they have one zixi, right? They often don't have enough time for their own family. So teachers are already working hard, they have to guide zoya. They usually don't have TAs helping them correct anything, right? Teachers are already working long hours. So how are we going to do anything in this situation? Please think about it deeply. Something that's doable. Hopeless. <laughs> Hopeless. Um, um, I, I want to share it's off. something that I I know last semester. I know the phonetics one is one of the required courses in education program. And even though some people learn English is very good, they are still required to take that because they need that course to get the um, certificate. certificate. Right. But what I heard was. Um, they don't. They didn't think it's necessary, and they view this class as a torture. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering that if you think this course is boring and and didn't help much to you, why do why do you want to take this? Yeah. Yeah. And the program is to to like produce our future teachers. Yeah. And you just act that way. And how how can we put help on you and help you can teach our children in the future? Good question. Yeah. Well, one thing is none of us likes to be forced to do anything. But the thing is, once you enter a university, you have to accept the requirements of the university. And if you accept them happily, your life is easier than if you're kicking and screaming. 
right? If you're kicking and screaming, it's going to make your life miserable. And the thing is that they think, well, I don't need it. They probably don't know a lot of the theoretical side of it. They don't know the names of the organs, how the sounds are produced, in which case they can't help their students when their students have problems. And I think you agree with that. Yeah. But these students say, well, I already speak English. That's, I, just, I don't need this. And you're thinking that if they have an attitude like that, what kind of a teacher are they going to be? Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a really good point. It's a demanding course. I have to admit that. Um, please give it some thought. Write about it on Monday. Given the current situation, it's very easy to say, well, it's hopeless, let's give up, because we all have to keep on living here, you know. <laughs> it's not such a bad country, there's not any, you know. Um, but there's a place, I mean, in this area, Taiwan is really lacking. It's really serious. Like in class today, a student said, well, because of his cream, he had to go to jail. Crying? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you got it. <laughs> well, that's what he said, and I kept asking him to repeat it. And that was just one typical mistake. I mean, it was over and over again. Admittedly, that was one of the weaker students. But many of the students, even if it was the title of the book they were reporting on, if it was the name of the author, every year I get people who, who read Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Every year it happens, Charles Dickens, they're reporting on him and they don't even check how to pronounce the author's name. So I think that for someone in the very top university, you're in English class, you picked my class, you, you heard on the BBS what this class is like already, you know, <laughs> and you still don't check before you go up and report. I mean, it's been, it's always, we've always had problems like this in past years, but this year it's, a, it's especially serious. So. If things are, if you think they're hopeless, that means we really have to do something. That means it's really urgent because we have to keep on going and we have to keep on training people. And they're not reaching their potential at all. If the bar is so low, if the overall standard is so low, people think that's good enough. If a teacher corrects cream into crime, they think, you know, don't bother me. We have to address that. How are we going to improve that? We can do it, but we'll probably have to We'll have to do it in baby steps. We can't ibudantian. It's impossible. And in addition, you know, I mean, you all started out from a very good level. You're the cream of the crop, not the crime of the crop. You're the cream of the crop. And you know that you yourself, to continue improving, you know how much work it takes and time for all of you to improve as much as you have improved by now. You have put a lot of time and effort into it. If you don't, then you keep getting corrected and then you get really irritated, right? You have put time and effort into it to get this far. How many people are going to be as motivated as you to put that time and effort into improving, right? You're willing to do it. You've set a goal. You've, you've come a long way, but you've worked hard. How many people are going to be willing to do that work and spend that time? You have to take that into consideration. So please, for Monday, I'd like you to write a shu for a shu, yeah, shu pian, <laughs> right, of what you wrote last time, based on realities in Taiwan. Hmm. One thing I noticed in the notes is somebody was mixing up vocal tract with vocal folds, saying the vocal tract vibrates. It's the vocal folds that vibrate. The vocal tract sort of gets vibrated along with it, but it's the vocal folds doing the work. Let's see if there's anything else here. I think that's it. We have two main things to do today. One is vowels, I don't know, vowels and consonants. Do you have any questions? And something interesting is I've been getting letters from mainland China from people who are watching this class. <laughs> You're surprised. I was too, actually. What do they say? Yeah. Well, one of them is very interesting. She said, well, I like your course, but really, I'd like to learn a British accent. Can you recommend something? <laughs> <laughs> um, others will say it's very helpful, and they'll just ask specific questions. The same person is asking about the echo method. She said, I can't find anything on it. And you know why, right? Yeah, OK. So it's some. Yeah, she can hardly find anything on echoic memory itself. I mean, it's already, to find, it's already hard to find things on echoic memory. But echo method is something that I developed in the course of teaching at Taida. So that's why there isn't much out there yet, because 
people don't know about it yet very much. But she wants to write about it for her, for her undergrad thesis. Okay, yeah, so she's having trouble finding materials. So yeah, this is getting out. Uh -huh. And the mainland is a natural place for it to go because we use a lot of Chinese in class. So yeah, as opposed to a place like Europe. Any questions on chapter seven? This book makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Does it make a lot more sense? Bella says yes. Carol? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any questions? If you don't, that's okay. We'll just move on. No questions? No? Everything's clear. Very good. Hand in your work, please. Have you done the logarithms tutorial? All right, make sure that you do it before Monday. Put it in your assignment book. It needs to be done before Monday because maybe next week we're going to do the tutorial on decibels, the decibels tutorial. And that's heavy science and math. When we do that, you need to bring a calculator to class. And if you want to borrow one, that's fine. And we won't have a lot to do with the calculator, but a few things. And you also need a calculator to do the t tutorial as well. Okay? So definitely do the logarithms tutorial before Monday. And then maybe by next Wednesday, we can do the decibels tutorial. That takes care of that. The rest of the time, we're going to concentrate on getting through chapter 8. Okay, we're on page 195, the second paragraph. Let me start. <clears throat> there is a great deal of similarity between figures 8.3 and 8.4. Good. A great deal of. Again. A great deal of. Good. <clears throat> figure with the, uh, figure 8.3 is like a schematic spectrogram of the isolated vowels. Figure 8.4 differs in I that... pass after the subject? Oh, figure 8.4 differs in that it represents a particular American English speaker rather than the mean of a number of speakers in American English. Speakers? Speakers of American English. All right. Look at 8.3 on the preceding page. And it has just lines to mark the formats, right? And these are, <clears throat> how did they get these numbers? <clears throat> it says right above the figure how they got them. They're the frequencies of the first three formants, but how did we get them a little earlier in the sentence? A little earlier in the sentence that you were just looking at on 193. The average of a number of authorities values. So he probably collected data from different phoneticians. These phoneticians collected average values, that's average values, for many different speakers, say for a bunch of male American speakers and for a bunch of female American speakers. And he took these different sources, and what did they do with them? They averaged them out, right? 就是很多不同来源, 不同的学者收集的这些语料. They themselves, these, probably these different sources, were averages already of about a bunch of speakers. And for this book, he averaged out the averages of a number of different books. Okay? That's how we got them. So they are very much averages. How is figure 8.4 different from that? Actually, it's the same in many ways. If you look at where the lines fall, right? Look at where the lines fall, and then you compare them to where the dark bands are on the next page. Flip back and forth and see how similar they are. Are they similar? Yes. Right. And it says here that how do they actually differ? For the ones in 8.4, we just recorded one particular male American English speaker. So that's the difference. But actually, the averages are pretty close. OK, let's keep going. It also shows the effects of the, of the consonant at the end of the words, which we will discuss later. And a slightly 
Steve Thong, Steve Thong Go, mm -hmm. character Steve of Thong Steve, Steve Thong, Thong Go, mm -hmm. character of some some of the vowels. Let's look at them. Let's find which ones seem to have the Thong character. In order to see it, look especially at F two. If you see movement in F two. That means that we have probably a diphthong on our hands. If F2 seems pretty stable and straight, then we don't see a diphthongal character. So which ones show a change in F2? <clears throat> ah, ch ah changes right at the end. That's way at the end, and that's probably because of the consonant that's coming. The d, there's a d there. So tajo. 最后最后才临时它分开, that's, that's true. And you can see F1 is going down too, right? Mm -hmm. So when you see a change, well, it will happen to both F2 and F1. There is diphthong a diphthongal character way at the end, but it's probably due to the consonant. How about others that have a change earlier in the vowel? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, right? Uh is strongly diphthongal in American English. Good. Uh, uh. It's very diphthongal in American English. It is not in British English. Good, 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 good. You can hear the difference? So it's not diphthongal in British. That's one thing that I often get wrong when I'm trying to speak British. It's very diphthongal in American English. How about another one? Ah, ah, we've also got a change in ah, ah, pad. Pad. You can see F2 going down there, right? Is it? Here's F2. It's going down a bit. F2 is going down a bit. How about in how about an I? Do we see a downward motion, a downward movement in I? Look here. Of course this is because of the initial sound, but hid, hid. This also has a diph diphthongal character to it. Um, e has a little bit, not so much. U has one way at the end. U has one way at the end. But U is very diphthongal. O, right? O is extremely diphthongal, highly diphthongal in American English. Okay, so you can see that when, especially F2 is moving somewhere, and it's not because it's way at the end because of the consonant, we've got a diphthongal character to the vowel. Okay? Okay, Ma. Let's go on. Right, right. How to distinguish between the rising in all? Okay. Ah has some, but it's mainly here because of the consonant. And this one's also getting ready for the consonant. But odd, odd. It is a bit earlier, I would say. His aw may not be as diphthongal as mine either. But it does start separating earlier. Okay? That's, that's about all I can say. With uh, right? With aw, you also have it. If it were me, it probably would be even more diphthongal. Because as I remember, ah, uh, as I remember, I think this is probably Bruce Hayes. And I think that he speaks more Californian. I'm not sure. I don't remember. With Californian, you'll have less of a diphthong because ah and ah is a bufenda. That may be it. But I'm guessing he probably has something of an ah there. I've heard him speak, but I can't remember now. Um, e is pretty stable. E is pretty stable. I, you can see F2 going down. E, we don't have much of a change. We have a little rise at the end. Eh, you can see a fall towards the end. Okay? Just so you're aware of that's what we're looking at. The vowels are not pure. E is pretty pure. U tends to be pure, more, much purer than U. But he just wants you to be aware of these changes signaling that it's got a diphthongal characteristic. Okay? Let's go on. Yeah. How do, how do we know that the rising is not because of the... Uh, but the, the consonant? Yep. If it comes right at the end, then I'm going to say it's mainly because of the consonant. So if he cut it more? If it starts a little earlier, then it's probably because it's got a diphthongal characteristic to it. Okay? Mm -hmm.
It's not precise, though, I have to say. Let's go on. Note, for example, that the vowel, it starts start with a higher second second formance, and that the vowel would has a large upward movement of the second formance. Okay, so for those two, they're clearly diphthongal. Yeah, bit. And this one, it was um, hid, hid. It's quite diphthongal in American English. And then for uh, hood, hood, got quite a clear diphthong there. Go on. There is also a small downward movement of the second formant during at, in, indicating diphthongization. 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 Mm, diphthongization. Diphthongization. Right. Of this vowel. Okay, so you can see F2 going down on a, ah, had, ha, ah. You can see it in my mouth. Had. You can see? Had. That's because it's diphthongal. Why do we have, um, why do these have diphthongal nature? What kinds of vowels? They're all short. In American English, it's short vowels. Plus aw, which is a long vowel, but that one is also diphthongal. Not because it's short, it just happens to be diphthongal. Okay? But remember that that one's zai zai shi wei. Let's go on. In addition, there are some extra horizontal bars corresponding to the two higher formants that are not listing linguistically significant. Mm -hmm. The exact position of the higher formants varies a great deal from speaker to speaker. Mm, make from clear. From speaker mm -hmm. to speaker. Okay. They are not uniquely determined for each speaker, but they certainly are indicative of indicative. A, indicative Good. of a cer a person's voice quality. Of a person's voice quality. Voice quality. Mm -hmm. Good. So, when we go above F3 to F4 and beyond, they're not necessarily unique to each person. It's not the case that every person is going to have a very unique pattern of F4, F5, etc., but they will reflect something about our voice quality. And it's something that we're just not going to do much with. I have seen studies that do take F4 into consideration. Sometimes you'll use F4, but not that often. Let's go on. Figure 8.5 shows spectrograms of Peter Ladefogel's form of British English. It is similar to figure 8.4, but, but not exactly the same. Stop it, stops. But not, but not exactly the mm -hmm. same because the same, same mm -hmm. because of the differences in accent, in and, accent. in accent and other individual differences. His hat was hat. Yep. His hat uh, was. It sounds like hat. Head. Hat. Head. Hat. You're going hat. Head. Head. There we go. Head. Uh -huh. His hat was larger than that of the American English speaker. American English speaker. I mean, or American. Here, of the American English speaker. Of, of the American English speaker. Mm -hmm. Because English is repeated. Of the American English speaker, of the American English speaker, mm -hmm. so all his formants were slightly lower. Mm -hmm. Also, also, his, also, his vowels, his mm -hmm. vowels were less diphthongal. 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 Mm -hmm. They had longer, steady states. Steady states. Why? Is it just because Peter Latifoged had a very unusual kind of English? No? It was very representative. He spoke very Beltun. They sound Beltun to RP. And that shows you how different the vowels are between British English and American English. You can see it. E is not so different because E is pretty stable in both dialects. But look at I. You find some going down, but that's probably due to the consonant at the end. During I, you don't have that. If you compare American I with British I, the British I does not fall right away. It falls at the end because of the consonant mainly. And U goes up, again, it's because of the final consonant mainly, towards the end. 
Um, a, if you look at F2, F2 is very straight in A for Peter Latifoged. A is also very straight except at the end. It's because of the vowel. Way at the end, we're not going to count that. During the most central part of the vowel, the main part of the vowel, his formants are very straight with high bien. They're very stable. They're very steady. And that shows you right there the big difference between American and British English. British English tends to have pure vowels. We have diphthongized short vowels in American. And that makes a really big difference in length and in other things. OK, look at the length of the vowels also in 8.5. Which are the longest ones? U and E are very long. Right. Does he have any short vowels that are very Also, A is pretty long. Because A, O in British, is a long vowel. So you can see that the long vowels are long and the short vowels are short, in contrast to American English, in which the short vowels, like A, are sometimes quite long. So you can see very clearly from the spectrograms that the whole classification of long and short makes wonderful sense for British English. It does not make so much sense for American English. right? Those diphthongs make our short vowels longer. And it makes some short vowels especially long, like a ah, is much longer than it. it is really quite short. A ah is pretty short. A ah is rather long. All right? So are we clear on that? Just compare those two, and you can see with your eyes the difference between the vowels. Maybe it may make it clearer than what you can hear with your ears. With your ears, we're so used to American English. We may not notice the things as much. But with the pictures, it's right there in front of us. Let's go on. Whenever the vocal folds are vi vibrating, there are regularly spaced vertical lines close together on the spectrogram. During the vowel, the vertical lines are visible throughout a large part of the spectrogram. Mm -hmm. Large. Large okay. part of the spectrogram. Mm -hmm. Each vertical line in the vowel is the result Owls. Uh, each vertical line in the vowels is the result of the momentary of the, of the momentary mm -hmm. increase of acoustic increase. increase. Remember the noun is stressed on the first syllable. Momentary increase of acoustic energy 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 okay. due to a single movement of the vocal folds. We have seen that. It is possible to observe the pulses in a record of yeah. the in a record of the waveform, and from this to calculate the pitch. 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 Okay. It is equally possible to measure the pitch from observation. If you want to, if you want to break it, where should you break it? Where should you pause? It is possible to measure yes. the pitch. Right. To measure the pitch from observations of the vertical station mm? stri striations, Try stri. striations, Good. striations Good. on spectrograms, mm -hmm. when they are close together, the pitch is higher than when they are farther apart. Let's stop there for a minute to make sure we understand. Last time we talked about how we could calculate the frequency of a sound, of a vowel, for example, from a spectrogram in the horizontal dimension. We see the frequency represented in the vertical dimension. And this is due to what we call a Fourier transform. I don't know if you ever learned about that in math. We're not going to do it, I promise you. <laughs> Have you heard of that? Yes. And you're making a bad face. <laughs> uh, I heard it's very notorious among my friends who study uh, mechanical uh, uh, engineering. Or the concept of it, in fact, is very simple. I don't know all the math of it, so you're lucky. I won't try to enforce, uh, force it on you. But what it does is simply a way of taking the sound that comes in, and then it automatically calculates what mark should go where. It's just a series of equations to put the frequencies where they belong up here. That's really what it is. 
，它是抓到一些余料，然后计算它的那个频率，然后把它放在该该放的地方。That's what the Fourier transform does. Because we already see the frequency here, but through the Fourier transform, it also puts the frequencies that are coming in in the sound signal up here on the vertical axis. Do you understand? It's getting sound coming in and it's analyzing the frequencies of the sound coming in. We have the F0, we have the fundamental frequency. It will figure that out and then it will hear these different formants and all of that information is coming into the computer and the computer has an analyzer that can figure out which frequencies are coming in. 就是你录音的时候，它自己就会这样子分析出里面有哪一些。哪些频率的成分在 ？You understand that the computer is analyzing. The computer can recognize, for example, there's nothing here at a thousand hertz, but there is something here at two thousand hertz. So the computer is picking out the frequencies from the sound signal when it comes in. It digitizes it, 把它数位化，然后呢，它就会抓出哪里有声音，它它就把它呈现在这里。不同大小声音的不同大小，它用不同声线来呈现出来。The computer is doing that. It needs a 数学程式 in order to do that. It's a series of equations, and that's the Fourier transform. You don't have to learn it. Just understand that that's what we're using. It doesn't happen by magic. It's through digitization and a mathematical algorithm or a mathematical a set of equations. Okay? So it gets the signal. It figures out what frequencies are present in the signal. And then puts marks wherever signals are present here on the spectrogram. That makes sense, doesn't it? Is it not clear to anybody? Can somebody be brave and say if it's not so clear? Wendy, how can you answer that question? So, you mean when you plug it in, it will detect what frequencies are in it? Just the computer will detect what frequencies are in it. Then, it will tell it to the computer what frequencies are in it. 这个频率的话，你这里画个黑线，这里没有频率你就留白，然后这边有频率，那你就再画回画画那个黑线。That makes sense, right? That's all we need to understand. Just so you understand the principle of how a spectrogram works. Carol, what are you thinking? Oh yeah, we don't have to do the formula. Oh no, we don't. Just so you understand the principle of how it works. It's a Fourier transform. That's how we get spectrograms. So. It's a very clever piece of software, and it's nice that a, a, a com computer can do it now. The first time that I ever made a spectrogram was in 1976, and at that time we did not have a lot of computers. We had some computers; they were very rare. I mean, they had them in schools mainly and offices, but people certainly didn't have computers at home. And at that time, do you still know what a fax is, Trenton? It works by heat-sensitive paper, right? Right, it's a 感热对 ，Well, that's what we used for spectrograms then. It was a metal drum, 是一个金属做的一个滚筒 And then you recorded your signal, and then it would have a Fourier transform that burned it into the heat-sensitive paper, so it would smoke and have a smell, and it would 一直滚滚滚滚滚，然后那个那个针它会一直对，直到那个整个滚筒它跑完了 And then I still have it at home. 我我改天我可以把它带来。对对对对 ，It's still from 1976. Still got it. Cause 那个课给我的那种震撼很大。It was a very impressive class, a really great class. So that's how we used to do spectrograms, and I got to do it. I mean, they gave a few students the chance to do it, and I said, ma ma ma. That's what I said. Cause I asked the question, what would happen with tones? How would a spectrogram represent tones? Cause I was just learning Chinese. 我那个时候是中文二年级吧，三年级之类的。Anyway, she said, "Well, why don't we try it?" So I volunteered, and that's what I said. And then we burned it in class. So it was a lot more work. You had to have expensive equipment. You certainly couldn't do it yourself in your dorm room. But now you can. All you need is a computer, and it's all free, just and an internet connection. So that's、um, basically how a spectrogram is produced. And. It says that we can count, we can figure out the frequency, like we said last time, because each striation—that's a word for vertical line. Striation means stripe. 就是条纹的意思 Each striation is one pulse from the vocal folds. So when the pitch is higher, 
Are they closer together or further apart? When the pitch is higher, are the lines closer together or further apart? Think about it. If the pitch is higher, are the lines going to be closer together for the higher pitch or for the lower pitch? They're going to be closer together for the higher pitch because we have more vibrations per second, right? 一秒钟，它那个嗯，pulses就要多很多，所以要挤在同样的空间内。So if you see a very dense packing of the vertical striations, then it's a higher pitch. For a lower pitch, they're going to be more spread out because there are fewer vibrations per second. Mm. Okay, let's keep going. At the bottom left, bottom, 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 mm -hmm. bottom left of figure. 那个, 刚刚那个发音是哪个字用的? Button. Button. Everyone, button. Button. No vowel. Button. Button. You mean? Button. Leave your tongue there. Don't move your tongue. Button. Button. Now you got it. But you're, you're moving your tongue. Leave your tongue up there. Button. Button. Mm. You're going but. It's not but. It's but. But. Mm. Okay. Leave your tongue. Don't. Don't let your tongue move. But. Mm. But. Mm. Okay. So again, you have to sing to be able But. But. Mm. But. Mm. I think you've got it. It sounds good. This one's different. This one's bottom. It's an ordinary tap. Okay. At the bottom left of figure eight point five, below the base baseline, but just. Above the symbol for all, mm -hmm. there are two small lines, one hundred, one hundred minutes apart. What do we? How do we read MS? Milliseconds. That's how miao. In Chinese, it's how miao. Okay, it's a hundred milliseconds apart. So at the bottom left, a figure eight point five. What do we see? <clears throat> Below the baseline, but just above the symbol for all, there are two small lines, 100 milli, uh, milliseconds apart. They're talking about the 尺度. They're just talking about the 尺度. This is our ruler. This is our scale that we're using. Okay? Within this tenth of a second, you can see that there are between eight and nine vertical striations in the vowel formants. All right. So. You can see here that this is ikke is how much time? Ikke so how much time? A hundred milliseconds, which is just a by how miao. So given to do shao miao. How miao su e how miao su given to ji miao. Given to ji miao. One one thousand. So e how miao is a thousand to a miao, right? Thousand to a miao is a thousand miao. So one hundred, one hundred how miao equals one thousand of a miao, one tenth of a second. That's all clear. So a thousand divided by a hundred, you get ten. So that's one tenth of a second. For each tenth of a second, we see how many striations. Okay, actually they're talking about these two marks here. They're using the this to do, but they've drawn it up here. Everybody see? Right here, everyone can see right under, it's right above the symbol for all. And they they already drew one And that's as long as the um, as the one tenth of one second mark below. And so if you count the vertical lines, if you use like a fine point pencil or something to point at it, can you count how many stripes there are? How many lines? It's about eight. It should be eight to nine, he says. And what does that tell us? It says um, there are between eight to nine vertical striations in the vowel formants. So between eight and nine, the average is 8.5, and because this is one tenth of a second, we multiply by 10 to get how many CPS, how many hertz, right? How many vibrations per second? So 8.5 times 10 is 85. There we go. Now that's really low. P 
Peter Latifoged had a very nice deep ba bass voice, and that's why it's so low. Okay, go ahead. This is not the best way of using spectrograms to det det determine the pitch. As we will see, it is possible to make another kind of spectrographic record that gives a better picture of the variations in pitch. Mm -hmm. Variations. Va variations in pitch. Good. That's just the way I say it. Others might say variations. All right, so now we have a pretty clear picture of what it is we see in a spectrogram. All of those vertical striations, each one is one pulse of the vocal folds, so we can count the frequency that way. But through the Fourier transform, we also can see a more detailed picture of the frequencies present in the signal. Pay attention now, this is different. All that we see here, we see the frequency of the signal here, but it's only one frequency, namely it's only the fundamental frequency that we can see by counting those vertical striations. If we want to know the frequencies of the formants, we're going to have to put it through the Fourier transform and look at the vertical axis. That will show us where other frequencies are present in that speech signal. Is that all clear? Tina, hi, Karima. One more time? Okay. So when we see these vertical lines, that tells us the fundamental frequency, how fast the vocal folds are vib vibrating, how many vibrations per second. These vertical lines, right? But that's only one kind of uh, information on frequency. It's only the fundamental frequency. It's only the vocal folds vibration that's being recorded there. We also want to know the frequencies of the formants, F1, F2, F3, right? Because we've got the different frequencies. 它也会有一些其他的那个frequencies在那个语那个讯号里面那那些frequencies你不能这样子来数线来知道它会呈现在上面这个voicing我们知道去数几条可是这样子这些横条那是经过Fourier now make sense? Good? Okay, Miranda, we're okay? Everyone's okay? Okay, please tell the truth, and I'm happy to repeat it if anything is not clear. Because if you keep everything clear as we go along, then we won't be in trouble in the future. If you miss something at the beginning, in the future you'll get really, really confused and really frustrated. That means we can take a break. All right, everybody ready? I'm going to go over it just one more time, because things that I mentioned in the little group over here, I may not have mentioned to the whole class. Just to go over it one more time, so be xian fan. These vertical lines, each one represents one pulse of the vocal folds. So if we just pick, for example, one little chunk here that's exactly one tenth of one second or one hundred milliseconds, we can count how many vertical stripes there are, multiply by ten because it's one tenth of a second, and then we get the number of hertz of the fundamental frequency. So these vertical striations, they give us information about the fundamental frequency. But at this point in our study, we're interested in formants. We want to know the frequencies of F1, of F2, and of F3. We want to know what those frequencies are because it's the formants that determine what the vowels are. Those are what distinguish one vowel from another vowel. Are you with me so far? Everyone's with me. So the reason that we use a spectrogram instead of just a waveform. A waveform gives us a lot of information too. Is because we want to see very clearly where those formants are, F1, F2, F3. It can record it for us through the Fourier transform. It will show us in the vertical axis where the formants are, at what frequencies they are. Even though they're kind of mushed together, they're mushed together vertically, horizontally, uh, uh, Horizontally, vertically the striations are very clear and very sharp. But horizontally, it's mushed together, so they look like very, mm, very blurry bars. If they were separate, and we've seen this before, but let's look again to compare. If we use a narrowband spectrogram, then the horizontal bars will be separated clearly, and you can see the overtones like on page 210. Look at the bottom spectrogram in figure 8.16. In the bottom spectrogram, 
In addition to those really dark black lines, you can see a bunch of smaller horizontal lines, right? Do you see them? That's what we can see with a narrowband spectrogram. Zhida dimension is very sloppy and blurry. Look here. Compare here to here. Do we need this? Do I need to put it on the screen or is it good enough in the book? Do you want me to put it on the screen or not? Yes or no? No. Okay. If you look at the top spectrogram, you can see that in this part, you can see the vertical lines are very clear. But if you look here, doesn't it look kind of blurry and sloppy? That's because each one gets one dimension fairly clear, but not the other dimension. So in the broadband spectrogram on the top, which dimension is clearer, the vertical or the horizontal? It's the horizontal dimension is represented very clearly. And in the bottom one, the vertical dimension is represented very clearly. So you can see all these stripes that we don't see in the top, right? Vertical, the dimension is represented very clearly. We can't do both at the same time. We can only pick one. Mm -hmm. In this one, the horizontal dimension is represented very clearly on top. It's confusing because the lines go the other way. So that's why you have to do some acrobatics in your brain. Your brain has to do some tzao to understand it. But I know you can all do it. It's all clear now, pretty much? If you got that, you're doing wonderful. You're doing really, really well. All right, the only thing I can tell you is that decibels will be harder, but not that much. Not that much harder, and I'm not going to test you on decibels. Decibels, I'm going to give you a bunch of information just so you have an idea of what's involved. For this stuff, you need to know it a little more precisely. Um, so we're all pretty much on the same page. Let's continue. The traditional articulatory descriptions of vowels are related to the formant frequencies. We can see that the first formant frequency indicated by the lowest of the three arrows in the frame for each vowel increases as the speaker moves from the high vowel in heat to the low vowel in head. All right, let's look at that. Now we're talking about which formant? F1, we're talking about F1, formant 1, the first formant, right? So look at E, find, find F1 and E. That's the lowest thick black blurry line with the first arrow at the bottom, going from the bottom. And then can you see when we go to I, do you see that F1 has gotten a bit higher? And when we go to E, it's still higher. And A, it's even higher still. So we now see that F1 is getting higher and higher as we go from E to I to E to E. And that's thanks to the spectrogram that we can actually see that. And remember, if we do it with our creaky voice, it's getting higher. We can hear it. And this is just making a picture of what we can hear. Good. Keep going. Um, in these four vowels, the first formant frequency goes up as the vowel height goes down, both for the American English speaker in figure 8.4 and for Peter Ladefogut in figure 8.5. Mm -hmm. Figure. Figure. Good. Let's compare. Go back to the American English speaker. Figure 8.4. Again, look at E, I, E, E. Do you see F1 going, getting higher and higher? Yes. Very clear. Let's keep going. In the four vowels in the bottom rows of figure 8.4 and 8.5, the first formant frequency decreases as the speaker goes from the low vowel in hard mm -hmm. to the high vowel in hood. 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 Good. Again, in these vowels. Again, in these vowels. 
Again, in this in these vowels, the first formant frequency is inversely related to vowel height. To vowel height. So for e, our tongue is very high or low. E, our tongue is very high or low. High. high. So when our tongue is high, then F1 is low. low. When our tongue is getting lower and lower, F1 is getting higher and higher. They are inversely related. Okay, tongue prime feet. And then let's see in the second row, we've got O, an O, an U, an U. And we're going higher. So we're starting out from a low vowel. It's just the reverse direction that we were going before. So we're going to start out high. And because our tongue is getting higher, F1 is getting steadily lower. We can see it, right? So for, for O, it's pretty, it's somewhat high. It's around where A is. And then for O, our tongue is higher. F1 is lower. U, it's getting lower still. And for U, it's the lowest. It's about the same level as for E, because those are the high vowels. So far, so good? Keep going. We can also see that the second formant frequency is the second formant frequency. The second formant frequency is much higher for the front vowels in the top row than it is for the back vowels. For the, for the uh -huh. back vowels in the bottom row in each figure. Alright. Figure. Figure. Everyone figure. Video. Makes me think of another word, video. Video. Because some people say video, it's video. Video, figure, they're both short. Yeah. All right, let's look at F2 now. We've already figured out F1. We have a really clear picture of F1. Let's look at F2. We know that F2 is high for E, right? It says the second form and frequency is much higher for the front vowels in the top row than it is for the back vowels in the bottom row. So right now, we're comparing front and back. Rather than high and low, we're going to compare front and back because this top row is all front vowels, the bottom row is all back vowels. So look at F2. F2 is pretty high in E, goes down a bit for I, a little more for E, and a little more for A. But when we look at O in pot, then we see that F2 is already very low. It's touching F1. At least the blurry part of it is. It's still low for O, as in, for example, pot. And then for U, U, U as in good, it's again still touching F1, and the same for U. So F2 is very, very close to F1 for all of the what vowels? Back. So F, F1 is pretty low here, and F2 is very close to it for all of the back vowels. But for the front vowels, it's pretty far apart. F2 and F1 are pretty far apart for the front vowels. Go back to the American English speaker and see if we see the same thing. Is it pretty much the same? Right. You can see that for U and U, F1 and F2 are not quite as close as they were for Peter Latifoget, but his, uh, his frequencies in general are lower. So we'll probably see less of a distinction there. But it's pretty much the same pattern. Let's keep going. But the correlation between the second form of frequency and the degree of backness of a vowel is not as good as that between the first form of frequency and the vowel height. All right, so what we're saying is that we are relating F1 to vowel what? height, right? F1 gives us a lot of information about vowel height. You need that for the test. F1 gives us a lot of information about vowel height. And it's pretty consistent because the high vowels all have a high or low F1. Low, high vowels all have a low F1. Uh, F2 gives us information about the degree of backness. That is in the dimension of front and back. However, it does not work quite as well as F1 works for giving us information about height. So vowel, uh, formant 1 gives us a lot of good information about vowel height. F2 gives us some information about backness but not as good as F1 does for height. Okay? Kaima, Annie, we okay? Fellow okay? Vivian? Kaima. So, F2 is less reliable. 
F2 gives us useful information, but it's not quite as reliable as F1 is for height. F2 tells us about backness, but it's not perfect. It's, it's a little bit weaker. And then? The second form and frequency is considerably affected by the degree of lip rounding as well as by vowel height. There we go. Now, F2 looks like we have more changes for the front vowels. Look at the front vowels again in figure 8.5. Here for E, I, E, A, we can see F2 steadily going down. But for the back vowels, it looks like F2 is not doing very much. It's pretty much staying in the same place. So it's not giving us quite as much information. And that's because something else is affecting F2, namely lip rounding. And we learned last time when we were talking about velocity and pressure maxima, do you remember? So what do we have at the lips? What kind of a maximum do we have at the lips? Go back to page 192 at the bottom. At the lips we have a velocity or a pressure maximum? Velocity. And when we compress the articulatory organs at a velocity maximum, then the frequency will go down. Remember it simply by V. Remember a V at the mouth, and when your lips are rounded, the frequency will go down. Lip rounding drives the frequency down. That's all you have to remember. V, lip rounding, frequency goes down. And then you can figure out the rest. P is at the glottis. If you compress there, the frequency will go up. But we're not worried about that now. We're worried about lip rounding because lip rounding we've always identified with which formant? F3, right? And it is really an important part of F3, but it also affects F2. And so that's why it doesn't work so well for the back vowels. Because lip rounding is driving the frequency down. And you see that F2 is all pretty low there. Well, lip rounding is helping make it lower. And where do we typically have lip rounding among vowels? Carol? The back vowels, right? So all of these are rounded. All the vowels that they've listed here, they don't have ah here. They have o, oh, an o, oh, but no ah. For ah, we don't have lip rounding. That's not listed here. For all of the back vowels that they've listed, they're all rounded. All of them have lower frequencies driven down by, by lip rounding because they're all rounded. Are we okay with that? If you've got that all clear, you're doing extremely, extremely well. Let's go on. Yes? There is someone who can, uh, uh, can sing Yes. And I ask how they do it. They yes. say you just you just pick one note and you keep going and you pronounce from E to U and U like that. And that's what I'm thinking. It's, it's, it's just like what the form, second form of do. It's like the, the frequency will go from high to low. You're absolutely right. But is that really the second format or is that is some of the fact between second and third? It's mainly the second format that you're hearing. And there are some formant singers or overtone singers, they can sing three notes at the same time. They can sing three notes at the same time. We're going to have a special web page about overtone singing. Lip rounding as well, but they're, they're manipulating the form, and so they have a fundamental frequency which is usually low. Usually it's low. And then they accentuate the formants so we can hear them louder. And you call them shao yin in Chinese. So, like the whistle formant is F2, right? So, they accentuate the formants, they make them louder, they learn what to do with their tongue so that it's loud enough so you can hear it. So you're hearing the formants louder than we normally hear them. Normally when we hear the formants and vowels, we don't notice different pitches. We just hear the vowel. We hear a fundamental frequency and a vowel. That's all we know. But people who do this kind of singing, overtone singing, um, they also call it throat singing. There are many names for it. Kome is the word, I think, yeah, in Mongolian. Did you go to the Mongolian performance? Wasn't it wonderful? It was so good. That one guy. He was so good. They were not students. They introduced them as students. And we had some Shetuan students just doing magic shows and things. And then they had professional singers and acrobats performing. So we wouldn't put chen. But anyway, it's all right. It was a wonderful performance. It was so good. So what they do is you can hear a low, you can hear a low fundamental frequency, 
And then they make the formants really loud and they manipulate them so they're singing a tune with the formants. You can start with one formant and you can add another one so you have three notes going at the same time. It's F0, F1, and F2 all at the same time. Yeah. And I didn't mean to talk about it today because we have a web page on it. I have friends who can do this. I have two friends who can do this. One is Lithuanian, one's French. I should get them to come, <laughs> or one of them, and demonstrate. You can learn how to do it online. Look for overtone singing on YouTube and you can learn it yourself. They teach you with amazing grace. It's, in a, it's a Chinese guy, a Chinese American guy. So you can learn it yourself, try it out. And I've got that whole web page that we will do later on once we've gotten through this stuff. But thanks for bringing that up. Did anybody else go to that performance of the Mongolians? Amy, Bella? Oh, a lot of you went. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, amazing. Last Saturday, they were as yeah, some from uh -huh. yeah, the same group. Mm, not really. I think one of the guys who sang Hoi, he was like a vocal. Uh -huh. yeah. Vocalist. Yeah, but other, other guys, they can also sing Hoi. I missed that one. I got the notice and I just got to visit. There were so many people. <sighs> and it was really good. Yeah, very good. Aren't you glad you went? Yeah. Yes, I'm glad you went too. Because that will help you understand formats better. It was a wonderful performance that I went to. Amy, what was your reaction? Because uh, I heard about, I heard this kind of singing last summer already. Uh, so I, I still like wanted to come because I could, you can't really find this in daily life. That's right. Unless you have friends like I do. I can, they will do it for me all the time. <laughs> they like to show it off a little, I think. Okay. No, not really. Not that often. But they're, they're very good at it. And they learned it. Um, let's continue. We can see some of the relationships between traditional articulatory descriptions and formants when we plot the formant frequencies given the in formant frequencies. the formant frequencies given in figure 8.3 along axis. Good. All right. AXIS is Zhou. Hengzhou Zhizhou the Zhou. AXIS is Zhou. The plural is axes. Just like basis. The plural is bases. Analysis, the plural is analyses. You replace the I with an E and you pronounce it ease. So analysis, analyses, basis, bases, axis, axes. The confusing thing is it's the same spelling as Handuo Fu Tao. A X or A X E. And then if it means Fu Tao, then we say axes. But this is axes, and you said it correctly. Go ahead. Axes, as shown in figure 8.6. Mm -hmm because the formant frequencies are inversely related to the traditional articulatory param para parameters. Second syllable stressed? Parameters. Very good. The, ax mm -hmm. the axes have been placed so that zero frequency would be at the top right corner of the figure rather than at the bottom left corner as is more usual in graphical re representations. All right, so if you look at the figure on 197, figure 8.6, normally we put zero down here, everybody look. Normally we're gonna put zero here. Zero both for the vertical and the horizontal axis, right? But here we flipped it over so that zero starts here. And the reason is because we're using it as a representation of the vowel space, of the vocal tract. So this is, U back here is here, E is up here. So it would be this way if it were my mouth. So you can't see it this way. But this is the back of the mouth. This is the front where your Shiyin is. So they flipped it over one corner to the other corner so it would look more like what we're used to seeing for the vocal space. Go on. Or the vowel space. <clears throat> In addition, the frequencies have been arranged in accordance with the bark scale, in which perceptually equal intervals mm -hmm. of intervals, intervals right. of pitch, of pitch, intervals of pitch, intervals of pitch, 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 pitch are represented as equal distance uh -huh. along the scale. All right. Let's see if we understand that. Look at the distance from one number that they give you to the next. So from 1,000 to 1,500, the difference is how many hertz? Everybody have to look so we know what we're talking about. 
Here we go from 1,000 to 1,500 hertz. The difference is how many hertz? That's 500 hertz, right? So that means that this length, if we repeated it, it would be like this. Because And the reason they do that is because why? How did they do? They call it the bark scale. And note that, underline that, the bark scale. That's a different way of arranging the frequencies that is more in accord with what? Right, exactly. It's how our ears filter sound. So if we think the difference between this sound and this sound is this much, then we give you a higher pitch and then we say, well, how about the difference between this and this? So they have recalibrated, recalibrate, calibrate, they've recalibrated the scale here to adapt it to how our ear perceives the differences between two pitches. Okay, ma? Actually, there's a whole scale that shows us which frequencies we're most sensitive to, and it's about 1200 to say 3200. So at certain frequencies, we're going to hear things, we're going to hear differences more clearly, more easily. At other frequencies, we'll hear them. It's more difficult to hear a difference. Okay? So we'll worry about it later. In any case, this is on the bark scale. They did experiments with lots of people, and they said, is the difference between these tones bigger than the difference between those tones or smaller? They did lots and lots of experiments with lots and lots of people, and they found that the data were very consistent. And that's how they came up with the bark scale. In any case, this is how they calibrated this scale, according to the bark scale, according to our sensitivity of hearing to different frequencies. Let's go on. Um, this is the bark scale, and like I said, it's calibrated according to, Amy, okay? Yeah, it's, it was done with experiments with many people, and we found that people's ears were pretty much the same in deciding whether uh, a certain interval is larger or smaller. So they tried to calibrate it so that the interval between two different sounds was the same at all frequencies. That's the bark scale. All right, let's go on. As a further refinement, because the second formant is not as prominent as the first formant. First formant. First formant, right. which on average has 80% of the energy in a vowel. Okay, now, I said 40% in another class. It says here that the first formant has 80% of the energy in a vowel. That means F1 has the lion's share of the energy. Just the whole vowel, the whole energy, F1. And that explains why they had to add darkness to F2 and F3 in the spectrograms, because the the energy in the other formants is much weaker. Let's go on. The second formant scale is not as expanded as the first formant scale. First formant scale. First formant scale. All right. All right. You can see that um, F1 and F2 are different. So um, the second formant, Okay. Remember that in figures 8.4 and 8.5 and in all the spectrograms in, in all? all the spectrograms in this book in this book in this book mm -hmm. the darkness scale does not correspond directly to the acoustic intensity of each sound okay. the higher frequencies have been given added emphasis to make them more visible okay that's all clear the higher the frequency, the less energy they have, so we had to make them darker. Are we okay so far? Let's keep going. On a plot of formant frequencies, E and U appear at, appear at the top left and right of the graph, and A and A at the bottom, with all the other vowels in between. Consequently, this arrangement allows us to represent vowels in a way that we have become accustomed 
accustomed to seeing them in traditional articulatory descriptions. All right, so let's go over that. On a plot of form and frequencies, E and U appear at the top left and right of the graph. So we flipped it over, we switched this corner to that corner. We've got E and U, so it's more like the mouth. Um, and then put all the other vowels in between. So this just makes it easier to imagine because it's like, it's like a human mouth of a person standing up. And what we said just now, the second formant is represented on the abscissa, that's the horizontal scale. It says it's less expanded than the vertical scale, F1. And F1, 200, 300, 400, 500, 其实它那个间隔没有改太多, Okay? But for F2, we changed it quite a bit. We compressed it. Let's go on. Do you want another paragraph, Amy? Or part of one? In the preceding paragraphs, we have been careful to refer to the correlation between formant frequencies and the traditional articulatory descriptions. This is because, as we noted in Chapter 1, traditional articulatory desc descriptions are not entirely satisfactory. They are often not in accord with the actual articulatory facts. For well over a hundred years, phoneticians have been describing vowels in terms such as high versus low and front versus back. There's no doubt that these terms are appropriate for describing the relations, relationships between different vowel qualities. Different vowel qualities? Between different vowel qualities, but to some extent, phoneticians have been using these terms as labels to specify acoustic dimensions rather than as descriptions of actual tongue positions. Tongue positions. Tongue positions. Right. As G. Oscar Russell, one of the pioneers in X-ray studies of vowels, said, phoneticians are thinking in terms of acoustic fact and using s mm -mm. Ph physiological mm -mm. Fa fantasy to express the idea. Very good, the idea. And he said this many times last semester, and he'll keep on saying it more before we finish the chapter. Look at this this vowel space here with the vowels marked on 197, figure 8.6. This looks really familiar, doesn't it? We learned this last semester. But last semester we learned it mainly as positions of the highest part of the tongue. Isn't that how we explained it? The point where the highest part of the tongue is when you form each of these vowels. But he says the way we got these, these figures was not from actual studies of where people put the highest part of their tongue. And we said this last semester many times. How did we get the information? Not by watching where people put their tongues, but how did we get this figure here? It's not, we didn't take an x-ray movie and then watch where people put their tongue for each vowel. Go ahead, Yumi. Um, okay, can we be more specific? We just use formant data. We're using acoustic data. Acoustic data. Just a sengshue的语料,而不是那个生理上的. We're not using anatomy or articulatory data we're using auditory acoustic data. Here it's a combination of acoustic and auditory because we made some changes in the scale based on our hearing, that makes it auditory. So it's acoustic and auditory based data. So although we say this is a high front vowel, this is a low back vowel, and 互相他们之间的关系差不多是这样子, but the high vowels are not necessarily extremely high, the low ones the back one's not necessarily low and back, etc. We get this figure from acoustic data. We got this from formants. Okay? So this is really acoustic data. It's not articulatory data. But we like to call it articulatory, uh, articulatory data because we're used to it. Daniel Jones did it years ago. He said, actually, no, it's not. It's acoustic. Let's go on. There's no doubt that the traditional description of vowel height is more closely related to the first form of frequency than to the height of the tongue. The so-called front-back dimension 
has a more complex relationship to the foreground frequencies. Okay, just slow down so we understand everything as we go along. So height is closely related to F1 and the front back dimension is more related to F2 but, keep going. As we have noted, the second format is affected by both backness and lip rounding. We can eliminate some of the effects of lip rounding by considering the second format in relation to the first. The degree of backness is best, relate, uh, is best related to the difference between the first and the second format frequencies. The closer they are together, the more back a vowel sounds. All right. So because F2 is not so accurate, because F2 adds in what factor? Lip rounding. We want to get rid of the lip rounding so we can see just a plain F2, right? It's not easy to do, but he says we can get rid of some of the effects of lip rounding by comparing second formant, the second formant to the first formant. The degree of backness is best related to the difference between the first and second formant frequencies. So it says the closer they are together, the more back a vowel sounds. And if you look at here, just F1 and F2, back. that's what it's saying. So the backness, we're using F2 to tell us the backness. For the front vowels, it works pretty well. Okay? For the front vowels, it, it works pretty well. But for the back vowels, everything looks kind of back. We just need to compare F1 and F2. F2 and F1, it's back. That's okay? Let's go on. Format charts are no, uh, Format charts are commonly used to represent vowel qualities, to consolidate acoustic notions about vowels. Acoustic notions. Acoustic notion about vowels. <laughs> uh, acoustic notions about vowels. Mm -hmm. You should now try to represent the vowels in Figure eight point four and eight, in Figures eight point four and eight point five in terms of a format chart. We have provided arrows that mark... Arrows? Arrows. I don't say arrows. Arrows is fine for the East. Arrows. Oh, arrows. Mm -hmm. We have provided arrows that mark what we take to be the formats that characterize these vowels. Measure these frequencies in terms of the scale on the left of each figure. Mm -hmm. Scale. Scale. Mm, in terms of the scale of... Um, in terms of the scale scale on the left of each figure. Say terms again. Terms. Good. In terms of the scale on the left of each figure. Good. Make a table listing the first and the second format frequencies. The first and the second format frequencies. The first and the second format frequencies. That's okay. Um, the first and the second format frequencies and plot the vowels. The reason I stress frequencies is because frequencies is very important here because we're going to be plotting the frequencies. So that's why I use the broadcaster's violation of compound stress. So when broadcasters are really high, they're going to override compound stress rules. Uh, so the first and second format frequencies and plot the vowels. I would stress them all because frequencies is important. Go on. Um, the first and second format frequencies. Uh, the first and second format frequencies right. and plot the vowels. That's the way I would translate it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A blank chart is provided as a blank chart. A blank chart is provided as a PDF file on the CD. Assignment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we got this far. That means we're going to plot. It's no big deal. I need two charts, one for American, one for British. Actually, you can, you can plot them both on the same one. Um, it gets a little more confusing, but you can compare it that way. So they want you to plot the vowels for American English and for British English, the ones that are given. These are not all the vowels we have, 8.4 and 8.5. You can use a different colored pen like one in black or one in blue and then one in red. And you print out the PDF file and then you just find the format frequencies for F1 and F2. You don't have to worry about F3. Just F1 and F2. Plot them 
on, plot them on, that, uh, on the chart that you're going to print out. Do one in blue and one in red, or one in black and one in red. So American and British. So you have two plots there. You'll have two systems. And hand that in on Monday. Okay? It's no big deal. It won't take, it'll take you less than an hour. So we have to plot them based on this chart. And, and the next one. This one. Right, American and British. Okay. Okay, in different colors on the chart. That's all clear? Okay, so um, plot vowels, so I remember. And we're going to go into consonants. This is something new now. What's going to happen to our scale? What's going to happen to our scale? We go up to how many hertz for vowels? For vowels? 4,000 for vowels, and now we're going to go up to 8,000, but not right away. For stops, we don't need to, but for fricatives, we do. When we get to fricatives, we're going to add, we're going to double um, the frequencies covered by the spectrogram. Let's go. We're going to get a start on it. Acoustics of consonants. Uh, the acoustic structure of consonants is usually more complicated than that of vowels. Okay, remember that part because that already is important. It, we have more complications with consonants because with vowels we really only need what kind of data? Three formants and we're done. Two formants is actually enough, but three formants gives us everything we need for vowels. But now we're going to need more stuff. Okay. In many cases, a consonant can be said to be a particular way of beginning or ending a vowel, and during the consonant articulation itself, there is no distinguishing fe feature. Okay, we talked about this last semester. Because consonants are often completely silent, like put, where's the T? Do you hear a T there? Pretty much all we're hearing is a vowel turning into silence. It's a vowel turning into silence. Put, right? Or top. It's ah turning into a silent P. So when we're trying to describe consonants, we have problems because consonants are often very quiet. Either it's complete silence for a voiceless consonant or Alternatively, if it's a, what other kind of stop do we have? I'm talking about stops, not just consonants in general. So it'll be completely silent for a voiceless stop. And then, if we have a voiced stop, it's not always voiced for one thing, but for example, Bob, we may have it, but we've just got at the end. It's going to be part of the voice bar. Remember the voice bar at the bottom? We'll see the voice bar. But we still have the same problems with voice consonants because it's a vowel turning into mm, right? So it's either a vowel turning into silence or a vowel turning into mm. And so vowels are a little harder to describe. We're going to have to look at what the vowels, or sorry, consonants are harder to describe, excuse me. Consonants are harder to describe, especially stops. We're going to have to look at vowels probably more than the consonant itself. Okay, let's go on. Um, thus, there is virtually no difference in the sounds during the actual closures of Paduk and absolutely none during the closures of Paduk. For at these moment, moments, there is only silence. So that's sort of restating what we just said. For the voiceless stops, PTK, Paduk, all we have is silence, no sound at all, zero sound. I put, there's no sound at all at the end of a word. For BDG, BDG, it says they are, they have virtually what? No difference because they are all, right? All of them are, so it's hard to tell them apart. So we have to look at the end of the vowel or the part of the vowel closest to the stop. Let's go on. Each of the stop sounds convey its quality by its effect on the adjacent vowel. On the adjacent. On the ad adjacent right. vowel. Okay. We have seen that during a vowel such as a, uh, there will be formants corresponding to a the. Pause. There will the be formants. Formants mm -hmm. corresponding 
to the particular shape of the vocal tract. Right. These formants will be present as the lips open in a syllable such as be. They will have frequencies corresponding to the particular shape that occurs at the moment that the lips come apart. That, that the lips come apart. That's good. You better stop there. That was the bell. We don't want to keep you over. This is heavy enough the way it is. We don't need to make, make it heavier by going over time. So, Sylvie, you'll continue next time. And let's just make sure we understand what we've read so far, though. The first paragraph, I think we've got it. We have silence with voiceless stops. We have with voice stops. And it says that we will only perceive the quality of the stops through what? Pretty much only through, the only way we can distinguish the stops, b from d from g, is through the, the adjacent vowel. That means 邻近的,旁边的. Adjacent means next to, g b. Adjacent is right next to. So we have to look at the vowel right next to the consonant in order to see the quality or hear the quality of the consonant. And during a vowel such as e, formants will correspond to the particular shape of the vocal tract. These formants will be present as the lips open in a syllable such as be. So even at the beginning of be, you're going to have the formants there. And then the consonant will have an effect on the vowel formants. Um, they will have frequencies corresponding to the particular shape that occurs at the moment the lips come apart. So as soon as it's be, as soon as we get the vowel, we will see the formants and they'll be affected by the b that came before it. And that's as far as we need to go. For next time you have your notes. Remember to include a continuation of your essay focusing on what? On what? Reality, okay. Yeah, how we can help people. Now, Wendy was saying that this course is kind of torture for some students. When we're concentrating on reality, we cannot use a method that is torture for people. So the method that we're using with you, I can do it because you're highly motivated and you're willing to put up with it to get this training for the credit or whatever your reason is. But most people are not going to be willing to do that. Please continue paying attention for a little while. Most people will find that torture and they don't want that much detail. Even the training in first semester, which was a lot easier than this semester, it was a lot easier. Last semester, or so, let's just say this semester is a lot harder. True or not so true? Mostly true? When do you think so? The rest of you, or is it hi how? Hi how? You mean things hi how? How about Amy? Harder? Hi how? Hi how? means we're going into 不同的领域. We're going into science and math and things like that, right? So anyway, it takes a different kind of brain, I think, a different kind of thinking. You have to be ready to do different kinds of thinking for this class. Now, even for first semester, which is more, more like Wen Xiaoyuan and stuff, that's still hard and that's still torture for people. So in addition to not having the teachers and the time, etc., you have to think of a method that we can use that people will not pai ci, will not say, oh, fan or that they're willing to use to improve. And also consider motivation. Because like I said, a lot of people, they just want to get through their class and their, get their grade and their credit. They don't have the terrible, shocking realization of what they need until they go to America or Britain. And they find, oh my gosh, I wish I'd studied harder. That's what all of them said. I wish I'd worked harder. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. So, the other thing to consider is motivation. What I'm saying is consider motivation. How do you get them to want to do better? Motivation. All right, so the continuation of your essay, taking reality and motivation into account. What else? Plot. Do the tutorial by Monday. Logarithms tutorial by Monday. Plot the vowels for. American and British English, and, and don't forget about vowels and consonants, and don't forget about your other notes. Okay, that's it. We'll see you on Monday.